Welcome to Nita's Excerpts from the Experts, seven-minute learning sessions with researchers and practitioners in the field of eating disorders and individuals who share their experiences and perspectives. I'm your host, Sarah Bowie-Keaton. This week, our guest is Dr. Alexandra Miratore. She is Assistant Professor of Clinical Medical Psychology at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. She is the recipient of the Global Foundation for Eating Disorders, GFED, Young Investigator Award, the first award made from the collaboration between GFED and NIDA. The grant is for conducting a pilot study using repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or RTMS, to understand the neurobiology of restricting eating in anorexia nervosa and to develop new effective treatments to target this behavior. Today, Dr. Miratore will be speaking about her research on repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation in anorexia nervosa and the purpose of her current study. Dr. Miratore, thank you so much for being with us on the program. Thank you so much for having me. To start, what is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation? Yeah, so uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which we also refer to as RTMS, um, is a non-invasive form of brain stimulation or neuromodulation. And basically what it does is it uses a magnetic field to stimulate different cells in the brain. So we can turn on or off different neurons in the brain, and that helps us to either increase or decrease activity in certain regions, depending on where we're targeting. What's really great about RTMS is that in addition to being very safe, it's extremely well tolerated by patients, and it's been used for a host of psychiatric disorders, including major depressive disorder. And it's particularly helpful when we know where in the brain that we want to be targeting. So when you're working with anorexia nervosa, what parts of the brain are involved? So my colleagues at Columbia have conducted, um, you know, some of the earliest research investigating the neural mechanisms of restrictive eating. And what we've learned from that series of studies is really that there is a particular uh, region of the brain um, within the basal ganglia, which is in the subcortical region of our brain, known as the dorsal striatum. And um, the dorsal striatum seems to really be more active in patients with anorexia nervosa when they're making decisions about what to eat um, or making certain choices about what foods they want. And so through a series of studies, we've kind of learned that not only is this brain uh, region more active when people are making decisions about what to eat, but throughout the course of treatment, patients who show decreases in this um, in activation of this brain region are actually more likely to make, uh, make more changes in their food choices over time. So kind of based on this body of research, you know, we're, we're starting to learn that, uh, that, this, that this region and potentially um, the, the other regions in, that it's connected to in the brain might underlie restrictive eating. So when you're using TMS in those parts of the brain with repeated exposure, you're seeing a diminished activation then in that part of the brain for patients with anorexia? That's a great question. So this kind of initial body of research that was conducted by Joanna Steinglass and colleagues at Columbia was really just to investigate using functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI, what part of the brain is more active when patients are making decisions about what to eat. So now with that information, we know kind of where in the brain we want to access and and kind of the next step in the research is to really uh, see if we can access that brain with brain stimulation, like repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, and if engaging that or accessing that through RTMS can actually change behavior. So we have a, we conducted a pilot study, a very kind of small initial study um, a couple of years back, which looked at whether or not a single session of TMS would be able to change food choice behavior, um, which we measured using a computerized food choice task. So patients received one session of real TMS and one session of sham TMS, which looks and sounds like real TMS, but doesn't actually change brain activity, and completed a computerized food choice task while they were receiving um, the sessions of TMS. And what we found was that uh, compared to sham, when patients were receiving real TMS, they were significantly more likely to make choices that were uh, or select higher fat foods during the task. So this kind of gave us an initial, you know, piece of evidence that TMS might actually be targeting the region that we want it to be targeting and might be a way to change behavior. That would be groundbreaking if this is something that takes off. So that was your pilot study results. Um, so you're currently working on a new study on RTMS. Is that right? 
Yes. So this kind of gave us that initial finding, um, but we what we haven't directly tested yet is whether or not when we're administering TMS to this part of the brain, whether or not it's actually changing the part of the brain that we think it is. And so for this next study that's funded by GFED and NIDA, we're able to look at kind of more definitively whether or not TMS to this circuit is actually one, changing the circuit that we think it is, and two, whether or not it's actually changing behavior. And so this is kind of a more causal test of whether or not TMS can can do what we think it can. Just out of curiosity, is this part of the brain affected in people who, before they start their nervosa, their anorexia nervosa eating habits? So it's there's a, like a genetic bio link there predisposition. Yeah, that is a great question and something that has been, that is the topic of ongoing research. So we know that when patients are acutely ill, they're, uh, they are engaging the dorsal striatum when they're making decisions about food and that healthy controls or healthy individuals don't engage that same uh, part of the brain. And we've also seen that that kind of engagement of the dorsal striatum continues even after a full course of, of treatment. What we're, what we're not yet clear about is whether or not that is something, you know, occurs before the illness starts or that's something um, that is a result of the illness. What's thought though is that the dorsal striatum is associated or can, has been associated with automatic behaviors and habitual behaviors. And so one, you know, hypothesis is that the dorsal striatum over time, um, when someone is engaging in restrictive eating and dieting and weight loss, over time that that, that region kind of takes over and becomes more responsible for that behavior um, as it becomes more habitual. So I know that it takes years usually when you uh, have a study and once it hits you know, evidence-based and becomes actual clinical practice, but what are the implications of your current study for those who are affected by anorexia nervosa? Yeah. So I guess uh, first is that we have kind of increasing evidence that anorexia nervosa is a brain-based disorder, um, and particularly that restrictive eating um, behavior, which is a behavior that patients find so, so difficult to change over time and to really stick with, that that in and of itself is also seems to be a brain-based behavior. The second kind of implication is that because we know about this now and because um, we have tools like transcranial magnetic stimulation, we can use this information to develop new treatments that are specifically targeting this behavior. And, and another thing to note is that the current study is uh, is recruiting adult female inpatients. But the hope is, you know, with research, we have to start small so that we can really more definitively test, you know, the hypothesis that we that we want to test. But the hope is over time to um, to test this question more broadly in more diverse samples so that we're not just restricted to treating individuals who are, you know, adults or females, um, but rather or inpatients, but rather a more diverse sample. What's the time frame for something like this to get to the next level? So we anticipate uh, recruiting uh, or we're hoping to recruit and we're currently recruiting about 30 female inpatients for this next phase of the research. And what this research will use is a combination of TMS, fMRI, uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and computerized tasks to test whether or not you know, TMS can actually be changing the behavior and the brain circuits that we that we think or hope it's changing. After that, the next step would really um, be to begin uh, building treatments. So hopefully in the next couple of years, um, we'll have enough data to learn, you know, how we can build treatments, what treatments would be most effective, and and whether or not this region is the right place that we need to be targeting. It just, it sounds like then it's just a kind of this constant internal battle that, that people have to constantly manage. Yeah. So th their treatments work for some, and we know that for adolescents in particular, family-based treatment is, is the most effective and current gold standard treatment for anorexia nervosa. But, you know, anecdotally, a lot of patients that we see, even if they are technically doing well or, you know, maintaining weight, even after weight restoration, we see that when given the chance, they're making choices that are more consistent with restrictive eating. So they're more likely to select low fat, low calorie foods. So that tells us that, you know, despite a full course of treatment, despite all of the things um, that they're doing and all the hard work that they're putting in, that restrictive eating tendency is still there at the end of treatment. And whether or not 
you know, that could be the reason that individuals find it so hard to, to stay well could mean that, that this is really where we need to target next and where the future of treatment is. Well, thank you so much for your work. I really thank appreciate you. uh, your time today. Thanks so much for having me. Nina's mission is to support individuals and families affected by eating disorders and serve as a catalyst for prevention, cures, and access to quality care. Nita offers programs and services designed to help you find the help and support you need. Whether you have been personally affected by an eating disorder or care about someone who has, recovery is possible and we're here to support you.